Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War Frontline Update for the 4th of September 2023. It's a beautiful day out there which is why I'm uh, partially dressed I guess uh, um, for the occasion. Hey whatever. Uh, anyway I'm going to go to the front line. It won't be a particularly long video. Many of you might be happy to hear. There's not a lot of information coming out, uh, as I always say, but then I can still manage to bang on for way too long. I just want to give you what Syriac Maps has said. So if you remember, my maps are made up of defensive lines of three different mappers, and now I've taken Syriac Maps off as the pro-Russian mapper. I like to have... A, 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 I would ideally like to have a pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian mapper uh, in my sort of synthesis of the sources, but without Syriac maps, I'm looking for a usable pro-Russian map to be able to get an idea of what they are thinking and claiming. So just to let you know, Syriac map says, we have not forgotten the events in Syria. In fact, a large thread has been in preparation for weeks regarding the situation of the country. And I think, you know, as you can tell, they, are, they started as a sort of Syrian mapping entity. Uh, anyway, uh, I wish I could share the events on a daily basis, but it is impossible. There are many personal and private reasons that must be dealt with first and are more of a priority. Until further notice, the accounts will remain offline. Uh, and that's that. So I presume uh, that that means that's the end of Syriac Maps, at least of the time being, with regard to mapping the Russian efforts and Ukrainian efforts in the war in Ukraine. Right, so at the moment we have Andrew Perpetua as a blue line, that's a Russian defensive line, and the white line is Deep State Map's pre counteroffensive line, so you can see where uh, there has been gains or uh, losses for Ukraine. Right, let's go to look at this Kupiansk to Svatova to Krimina uh, direction first. I don't have any other sources other than the ISW, and this is from last night, so this is summarizing yesterday's activities, Ukrainian Luhansk. Oblast head stated that Russian forces resumed offensive operations or actions near Novohayarivka after significant Russian losses over the past week prompted a short pause in Russian offensive activity in the area. Okay, now this is to say that around Svatova, just to the west of Svatova, uh, west southwest, there is this area where the Russians pushed uh, Karmazianivka forward into Ukrainian territory and um, they had some success getting to the west of the Zherevets River, and then they were pushed back subsequently. And then they took a little bit of uh, land around uh, Novohayarivka over the last couple of days. But this has been at some expense. I reported that in one, I think, so in some footage, there, there were six tanks evidenced as being taken out. And then some other footage, that, or not footage, another source yesterday claimed that there were many pieces of equipment lost. So the Russians could well have lost a lot around here. Well, we now have the Ukrainian uh, head of uh, Luhansk Oblast saying that they've had to take a pause uh, due to the losses over the last week. Um, so that obviously the Russians have lost a lot of equipment around here. Well, not obviously, but it, it appears to be the case. Anyway, uh, just to continue, another Russian mill blog claimed that Russian forces captured six unspecified positions northwest of Petropavlivka, which is further to the north here. Uh, Petra Pavlivka is up in uh, in the Kupiansk area just there. So somewhere around here, apparently six uh, positions have been taken by the Russians, but, you know, that's unspecified. No real details as to uh, what's going on there. So we'll actually come down all the way to Bakhmut after that. I mean, just to let you know that there is repelled activity. There's all the normal stuff kind of going on all along this front. So it is an active front line, uh, and there is activity taking place in Terebiansky Forest, in around Bilohorivka, uh, but uh, there's no changes to the mapping here. We're going to go to Bakhmut, um, and we'll go to the ISW to see what they have to say. And actually, you know, not a great deal that's going to be outside of what I'm going to tell you anyway. A uh, mill blogger claimed that Ukrainian forces have reduced their operational tempo near the Bakivka Reservoir north of Bakhmut, which is to say that here um, north of Bakhmut in the Bakivka area, the Ukrainians have sort of settled down on well they, they they're not so active there and actually that was something that we we started to witness you know maybe three weeks ago now or, or so they stepped back from there because i think that it was just too attritional for them to try and take that land to the north of bakhmut uh, concentrating instead to the south where they're having more success and that success appears to be continuing now we have an added yellow line here i'm wondering whether to continue the yellow line all the way around uh, 
the front lines. The yellow line is the deep state map lines for the Russian defensive line. Now, this is a pro Ukrainian mapper that does do things aligned to the Ukrainian uh, general staff, and they will not change maps if the general staff tell them not to. Uh, and they will have sometimes an operational delay, or operational security delay on changing the maps if it is in the best interest of Ukrainian armed forces. So bear that in mind, you know, when interpreting the data, sometimes there's a lag, but sometimes they're actually ahead of the game as well. Uh, because they have access to some uh, some good data. So anyway, they in the area are saying that the Ukrainians are making gains, continued gains in the Klyshchivka sector, and that is south of Bakhmut. Uh, we are seeing that the Russians are pushed pretty much out of Klyshchivka now. They might have some sort of tenuous contesting of the northern part of it, uh, but we've seen that the bridge was destroyed north of there, and the Ukrainians have possibly interdicted or at least contested areas of this railway line that comes up so it's very difficult for the russians to get supply to their troops in klishivka so it's really a bit of a dead end for them and it, it's worth sort of pulling out but interestingly there's some minor gains they've got up here uh, which is very close to this area that the ukrainians uh, had conceded or the russians had taken uh, on on the high ground as it comes north of klishivka i wonder whether actually the russians still control that area uh, because remember Andrew Perpetua bases his mapping a lot on uh, shelling and if there's not shelling it doesn't you know it's hard for him to say that actually the, the Russians aren't there so if they pulled out and there's no shelling there then that might indicate they're not there but you, you wouldn't you don't necessarily see no shelling I mean you can tell that there, there isn't more shelling there but it doesn't mean that you're going to change your maps without some other evidence I would think so it could be that the Ukrainians have pushed the Russians back from there. It's my general point. Right. No reports says, uh, it just talks about this. I only initially said this was uh, down near Novoprokhorovka, but then said actually it's near Bakhmut. And it is indeed uh, north of Bakhmut um, in the Yahidni Bukivka sort of area that I was talking about before, saying that they've actually calmed down attacking around there. But it was just, uh, I showed you this in the news uh, video this morning that actually, you know, this is a, a significant trench line there you see a, a shell hitting the trench line and then people running this way it almost directly under where the shell landed and they you know it clearly survived to kind of run on uh, as we see them there and which is to say that these trenches offered some decent protection against shelling as you can see from the pockmarked fields that they they are absolutely hammered um but they are substantial defenses and that is why it's difficult for the ukrainians take ground quickly. I mean, they, the Russians have been able to build up some really significant defences. Talking about Bakhmut, the Deputy Defence Minister Hanna Malia said that three square kilometres had been liberated in the last week. Um, also, that things are going well down in the southern Robotina sector. But anyway, it, with the regard to Bakhmut last week, it was very hot in Klyshivka, Kordyumivka and Ozarinivka, she added. So that is um, the, saying that, you know, things are going well. And indeed, when you see footage like this, and I, again, I talked about this in my news piece this morning, uh, dozens of soldiers surrender in Klyshivka area south of Bakhmut. Um, this gives you an indication that Things aren't going well for the Ukrainians. So when you have this many people surrendering at once, it means that all of those people think it's in though their best interest to give up uh, and surrender themselves to the Ukrainians. In other words, life will be better under Ukrainian captivity than under uh, Russian command. That things are hopeless for them because you know they will give themselves up to the enemy, even given... Uh, the psyops that has been oh, i'll talk about that in a second but it just means that they they don't see themselves as winning in the area and they don't see life under russian command as as good as being under life under ukrainian captivity now there's been psyops i don't know if it's in this particular area but on the front lines where the russians have delivered leaflets to their soldiers to say by the way if you get captured you will be killed by the ukrainians and this is obviously their attempt to stop stuff like this happening. So, you know, if, if you read that and go, oh my goodness, right, we better not survive, um, better not surrender because we will be shot. But hopefully the Russian soldiers are skeptical enough of the own, uh, of, of the information being passed down to them by their own forces. So anyway, that is, I think, really significant. That's, a, that's a dozens potentially of POWs there giving up at once. And will there become 
a will, will there be a tipping point where the russians start surrendering on mass like this uh because if if that becomes more widespread then it's game over russian forces if they start surrendering on mass you know they're, they're, there's no amount of mobilization that's going to overcome that you, you, it just shows endemic morale issues and uh a kind of sense of hopelessness so i hope that 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 does gather momentum we have seen an awful lot of footage of pow's in dribs and drabs here and there and here and there and pretty much everywhere so there are large numbers of russian forces being captured right uh, as uh, this is global war monitor saying uh, ukraine has advanced another 350 meters in klishchivka so yesterday they added the, this lower green bit and i was saying yesterday that that signified that the ukrainians had 80 percent of of klishchivka under their control and that was sort of up to the bottom of that reservoir there so this was this area and then in line with what deep state map has added uh, global war monitor probably oops probably uh, referring or depending on deep state maps um, mapping has said you know further ground has been gained and control has been won for the ukrainians by and for the ukrainians so uh, that is a uh, good yeah good news in in Klishchivka. a couple of areas here both in the in the north east and the east of the settlement um but yeah not too much news coming from there we just hope that there's success across the railway line for the Ukrainians south of Andreevka and in taking Andreevka itself. Right, we move on from there further to the south. We come back to the Institute for the Study of War. Again, you know, there's lots more to be said, but you, you get the idea generally that, that they're going to be fighting in all the same places. Same with um, uh, uh, Avdivka here. So if we come further to the south, to Avdivka, to the north, around Avdivka and to the south, all the normal sort of place names mentioned, um, Krasna Harivka uh, a few times, and then further down south to Novomokhalivka. Um, geolocated footage posted on September the 2nd indicates advances in Marinka for the Russians. Now we're going to check that out, but uh, remember yesterday Kenneth Gregg said that he, you know, he made a claim that the Russians were on the western outskirts of Marinka. Now, if that is the case, I mean, if we go back to, well, no, we don't need to go back to Syria maps, as you can get a good sense of here. So, uh, Andrew Perpetua has the, the Russian defensive line just over the Drisby Avenue, uh, where it was fought over for an awful long time, the central road going through, I say central, but actually, you know, two thirds of Marinka is to the, to the uh, east of that, that road. Um, but yeah, the idea that they'd suddenly lost all of this ground in in a day or so it seemed to me somewhat unrealistic let's see what the ISW claims in terms of geolocation so the claim refers to this footage which is a russian tank firing on western marinka i mean you can see everything is just rubble by this right ah. <laughs> uh yeah everything is just absolute rubble there and Trees are stripped, buildings are reduced to, to nothing. Anyway, uh, the claim here is that the, a Russian tank is active, starts at this position. So this shows an advance. I'm going to be interested to see what this turns up, actually, to see where, where a Russian tank is uh, and whether there is indeed uh, any advance. Um, yeah, wow. Okay, so that is fairly significant. Although I wonder if this was the footage that Andrew Perpetua was talking about, about a tank that did advance on its own behind enemy lines and then had to pull back and said it, it had to pull back because it was it didn't have any support and they had 80 GMs. And then it said it was unable to go forward again. So the, there is this footage that was taken out of context. I, I read you what Andrew Perpetua was saying about that, but I didn't see the original footage and this could be it could well be it and it said it took away the in fact let's go and research that now yeah so that's exactly what it is um a russian tank pushed past the ukrainian line fired a few shots and then withdrew ukrainian soldiers tried to disable the tank with rpg7 but the shots missed artillery shelling also missed so this was a very lucky russian tank way behind uh, their own lines in fact the so that video is a two minute 19 video the original one is seven minutes three uh, you can't see it on 
the browser-based version of Telegram. What we can do is we can translate this uh, for you. There's actually one good thing about using uh, um, Microsoft Edge as opposed to uh, Google is it translates in position rather than gives you Google Translate puts it up here. So uh, uh, that's actually pretty good. Anyway, beautiful shots of a working T-72 B-3M tank during an attack on a stronghold of the armed forces of Ukraine in the village of Marinko. The crew of the tank drove through the line of contact and drove to the rear of the armed forces of Ukraine where they struck the tank sh uh, with tank shots directly at the enemy's fortified areas so that not a single pig could raise its head from the horror movie they saw. Our, after our crew worked on the fortified area of the enemy, he began to roll back when the enemy of the armed forces of Ukraine tried to inflict fire damage with shots from the RPG-7, but he did not succeed, and the enemy turned out to be oblique or not trained. The crew, after returning to the starting line, loaded the ammunition shells and repeated the departure a second time, but from the line of contact. Now, I think that this is a claim that... Uh, Andrew Perpetua was having an issue with as well because he was saying that there there are six paragraphs of actually what happened and even that might be a bastardization of the truth because there was a talk about how uh, Ukrainians had ATGNs but it could be that one I'm not I'm, I'm not sure so just take these kinds of the pinch of salt the the question is does this signify that the line of contact has shifted had, had th that the Russian control uh, has shifted four streets or they're not really streets anymore but you know to the uh to the west i don't know that it does uh, but it probably does indicate that the ukrainians are under some pressure here if a tank can get four streets back here take off some shots and then come back and then as according to that source at least do it again then that shows that actually this is fairly porous and that the uh ukrainians could be in trouble in marinka does it mean they've been pushed to the western outskirts? I don't think so. Uh, but I, I would be slightly worried about Marienka from a Ukrainian point of view. Anyway, that's my tuppence or about what's happened there. Uh, but it, but otherwise, it's sort of repelled uh, attacks in the rest of the area. And then we go down to uh, Zaporizhia. Well, actually, no, to still in Donetsk. We'll come to the western outskirts of Donetsk down to uh, this area. Um by Veliko Novosilka and Priyutne, just to let you know though, I have, I've marked this from a difference on Andrew Perpetua's map. So quite often, and I say this regularly, quite often there are gains by the Ukrainians and for the Russians as well, that, that, that is, that do not signify a change in defensive lines of either side, but it is taking more control of the gray zone. So this is an example of that. So just, but I thought it was significant enough to note so the, Andrew Perpetua has the Ukrainians. This is all sort of grey zone south of Butladar. And here we have this sort of settlement, this complex uh, to the north of uh, Pavlivka that the Ukrainians had taken, have taken control of, and that's now not in the grey zone. So the Ukrainians now control this, which means that actually there's very little grey zone between them and the Russian defensive line. Uh, and so you might see Pavlivka become... Uh, Bit of a centerpiece in some in a forthcoming battle i don't know if that will be the case but there are some gains there uh, north of that settlement now nothing really coming out of this area of donetsk uh, there are claims as the rsw states that uh Ryutne is seeing quite a bit of activity so th that's going to be in between here i would assume although Priyutne as well um but there are claims that this has been leveled off and I haven't seen that from at least from Andrew Perpetua it doesn't mean that, that that is still the case the the the, the Russians are still uh, active up here it could well be that they've been pushed back but it's just not reflected in Andrew Perpetua's mapping right let's move to the west uh, that is still a case of uh, it going somewhat quieter than it than it was in the Velika Novosilka area right a lot of fierce fighting taking place in the Robotina area uh, let's look at some of the sources here. ISW to start with has many of the usual kind of claims of of success for the Ukrainians to the east of Novopokropivka. What's being said today? Well, War Gonzo saying that Ukrainians have activated a new assault axis in Drozhnyanka. Uh, so we go and look at exactly uh, what he says. So this is in his early update. Russian mill blogger War Gonzo reports that Ukrainians are advancing in the grey zone east of Novopokropivka towards Ocherotuvate 
and that they are attacking near Drozdnyanka. So just to give you an understanding where that is, that's that's having success or advancing around this area, the Ukrainians, east of Novoprokopivka, but also uh, opening potentially opening up another front here or another sector by Drozdnyanka. So he, the words that he says are, as I shared with you this morning, Zaporizhia, the Ukrainian armed forces with artillery support attacked east of Novoprokopivka in the direction of Ocherotovati, and it there is progress in the grey zone. So again, this is a case of the Ukrainians taking control of area that was previously grey zone. So they are making advances, but it might not be reflected on the map. Uh, they carried out similar actions in the Drozhnyanki area. So interesting. And there's extensive artillery being, being used. So for Andrew Perpetua, we've had the Ukrainians take consolidated control of this area there, which won't have been reflected on uh, changing uh, the defensive lines and mapping changes, but is actually significant. So they this allows them to control this area and use it much more um, freely, I guess. It depends on artillery for supplying their own troops on the front line. Um, and there are some small gains here, as according to Andrew Perpetua for the Ukrainians, where they've pushed the Russians back um, to the north of Vobove, uh, in between Vobove and Novoprokrovka. Novoprokrovka seems to be very vulnerable now, uh, holding on there, um, but I, I don't know how long for. Right, let's look at another couple of sources. So worrying, uh, as according to you Russians here, the situation in Robotina becomes tense. The enemy, that's the Ukrainians, attacks are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and then this is, uh, again, another reference to Wargonzo there. Wargonzo confirming that Ukrainian spokesperson said eight days ago, P-Style 1-1 one says, I'm going to speculate that the situation for the Russians is way worse than admitted. Um, uh, so that's why I included this. I mean, it's the idea that if if the Russians kind of begrudgingly say, yeah, this is happening, then you can imagine it's it's a lot worse than that. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. And then this is not something I've seen anywhere else or mentioned anywhere else, but this is to go further to the West. So not too much granular detail coming out from the Robotina area, but you can rest assured that it is incredibly active. I mean, there's talk about it being severe there, uh, and that's from Russian sources. Uh, this is so if you look where the defensive line is at the moment so you've got this road coming down and the russian defensive line this is near the zaporizhia uh, um, reservoir you've got the road coming down from kamianska down to vasilivka uh, here and uh, this area is subject to a claim that the ukrainians have advanced by one kilometer along the road to kamianska uh, on the coast of what used to be the Kukovka Reservoir, one square kilometer has been added, added to the liberated status. So that is to go down uh, sort of in the middle of that long settlement going southeast. That is quite significant if that's the case. So that is to say that the Ukrainians now control this area going down there. It's not a settlement per se. I mean, it's a ravine by the looks of it. Uh, so I've misinterpreted that. Uh, yeah, that's a ravine, not a settlement. Um, so the Ukrainians are controlling that land and there's a little bit grey zone and the Russians are pushed back behind that. That would be quite significant, I think. It means that the Russians are pushed back here and the Ukrainians have pushed this out of the grey zone into their control, as according to Global War Monitor. Of course, take all these claims with a pinch of salt, but I think that that's going to be pretty significant because there's been this bit of a stasis there since we saw Ukrainians make some good advances uh, given that Zerubyanki seems to be a really difficult nut to crack for, for the Ukrainians. So there's positional fighting going on there, but I was expecting there to be slightly more joy here, and then it kind of stopped as well. So that would uh, that's good news for the Ukrainians. Uh, and then when it comes to Kherson and Dnipro River, so we come down here, we look at what sources I have, and very, very little. But Ukrainian artillery hit and destroyed a sabotage and reconnaissance unit of Russian forces along with their boats. Uh, north of Nipriani, attempting to cross the Dnipro River in Kherson region. This is near Novokokovka. Now, there was a flag, a Ukrainian flag raised in Novokokovka yesterday uh, by partisans, one would assume. Uh, but that is that is important. I think, you know, Russians are, are hit there. That We saw activity um, by Kazachi Lahiri. I wonder whether it's a game of whack-a-mole along the river here, popping up with sort of deep reconnaissance groups trying to do... Uh, trying to cause the Russians as much uh, of a headache as possible and getting to 
try and plug those holes, stretch their defences uh, more than they are happy to do. So anyway, there is activity along that river, but uh, nothing too significant that it gives us sort of any mapping changes or anything past that anyway uh thanks for watching that's the frontline update for today not a great amount of news uh but things are of course still happening uh take care and i'll speak to you soon